Hi folks, welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Jennifer Gagnon with the Forest Landowner Education Program at Virginia Tech. And today I'm joining you from my farm outside of Snowville, Virginia. I'm gonna to talk to you about early spring bloomers. So things that are, are some of the first flowers that you see every year. And these species are really important. First of all, they give us hope that spring and warmer weather are on the way. And secondly, they provide a really important source of food for a lot of pollinators. So I'm going to focus on five specific species today, but I'm also going to point out some other things that are blooming as we go along. I'm only going to talk about one woody species today, and it is this one right here, Lindira benzoin, uh, more commonly known as spicebush. And spicebush is in the family Lauraceae, which is the laurel family. And the laurel family contains other species you might know, such as sassafras, um, avocado, red bay. Um, so some real common species in this family. And spicebush is relatively common here in the Appalachian Mountains as well. And spicebush is found anywhere from New York to points further south along the East Coast this time of year when it's blooming um, it really stands out now the flowers are, are pale yellow and they're pretty small but they occur in clumps and there are a lot of them so it does make this fairly showy the fruit on a spice bush is a red droop uh, which is favored by a lot of different bird species um, including wood thrush and berries and some game birds, if you're lucky enough to have bobwhite quail on your property, uh, they will eat the fruits of the spice bush. It's also an early source of nectar for a lot of small pollinators like uh, bees, flies, and even ants. And it attracts moths and butterflies. Uh, specifically, it will attract the spice bush swallowtail butterfly, um, whose larvae will use this for food. The fruits of the spice bush are edible. They have a mild allspice type flavor to them. The Native Americans use spice bush as a medicinal tea. And if you dry and ground up the bark of the spice bush, it can be a substitute for cinnamon. And spice bush twigs are also fragrance. If you snap a twig, it's got a real distinctive spicy smell to it. The trouble with a lot of these spring ephemerals is that they are very small plants and so they require a lot of um, climbing around on the ground, sitting on the ground, and awkward camera angles to show you. But that's fine. You're totally worth it. So I am sitting here in a patch of spring beauties and these things are just so charming and so lovely. They're not rare. Um, they're actually quite common, but they are just a lovely little spring ephemeral. Uh, their name is Claytonia virginica, and they were named after John Clayton, who was a botanist that arrived in Virginia in the early 1700s. They're in the Portulacaceae family, which is the purslane family, and there are about 500 species of flowering plants in it. So this is what we call a low-growing spring ephemeral. And ephemerals are groups of, a group of plants that take advantage of a very short period of time in the early spring when the soil is starting to warm up, but the overstory and midstory trees have not leafed out yet. And so that gives them access to a lot of sunlight for a brief period of time. Um, and then they can complete their entire life cycle in that short period of time. The entire above ground portion of Spring Beauties is edible. Um, the leaves can be boiled in salted water and eaten, although they're not really a, a recommended food. And the below ground structures are also edible. So the roots have been touted as being a substitute for a potato. They can be buttered and salted um, and eaten that way. And of course, anything that's buttered and salted tastes good. Uh, but the roots, the, the, the little root structures are pretty small, and so it requires a lot of foraging to actually get enough for a meal. So you'd have to be uh, pretty hungry to do all that work for not much food. 
So here's a close-up view of these gorgeous little flowers. They're about three quarters of an inch wide. They have five petals and they're pink to white. And they have pink veins, which I read were, were they act as bee guides to guide the bee to the center of the flower. And here are some of the leaves. The leaves are very long and slender. And as you might imagine, it would take a lot of these leaves to make a decent meal. Here's a little patch of spring beauties that are much pinker in color than the last ones that we looked at. So there is some variation. So on my scouting mission yesterday, I was really excited to find this species uh, with its reproductive structures out. So this is not a blooming plant per se, it's a spore producing plant, uh, but these are its reproductive structures. And so this is ground cedar, also known as running cedar and crow's foot, and it's Diphasiastrum digitatum, and it's in the family Lycopodiaceae. And so this is one of the oldest families of vascular plants on the earth. Uh, they, they started developing about 400 million years ago, and there's about 400 species in this family. Um, so it's, it's an early type of vascular plant, vascular meaning that this type of plant has a xylem and a phloem. And so these are cell structures that allow the plant to move water up from the root system to the leaves, and sugars from the leaves down into the root systems. So a very ancient type of plant. Uh, these are located in the eastern part of North America, including parts of Canada, such as Ontario and Quebec, and they are found as far south as Florida and Louisiana. So the leaves are shiny, green, they're evergreen, and they're waxy, and they're flattened along one plane. So if I hold the whole structure like this, it looks flat along the top. And there's actually four leaves here. One, two, three, four, that are whirled around the stem. And these are actually, it might remind you of something like Eastern Red Cedar, where they have these scale-like leaves, not typical broad leaves, not needles like a pine, but these scales. The stems are rectangular in the cross section. And the plants themselves are low growing. They're four to eight inches in height. And they spread by these runners that grow along the ground right under the duff layer. And this is the duff layer here, all this debris. So the strobuli are these structures here. And there's usually two to four of them on each stalk, and this stalk is called a peduncle. So again, this is where the spores will develop, and when they're mature, they will be dispersed by the wind. Now, running cedar is part of a larger group of species, like apodiums, um, and part known as club mosses, which have traditionally had a lot of uses for humans. Um, club mosses as a whole also are known to have some medicinal properties. Now, I will mention medicinal uses for a lot of these things I talk about today. I'm not a doctor. I am not making recommendations that you treat anything with these, but these are some traditional uses of the species. Um, so club moss tincture can be used to, um, to help digestive and urinary tract problems by removing toxins from the body. Um, it's an antimicrobial, an antifungal, and hey, an antiviral. Um, so there are some medicinal uses for it. Again, I'm not making recommendations. Here's another beautiful plant that is just blooming at the moment. I do not know what it is, but I will try to identify it. So this little guy here is cut leaf toothwort. Cardamine con cantonata. It's also known as crow's toes and pepper root, and it's in the family Brassicaceae, and that's the mustard family, and you probably know a lot of things in that family. It includes things like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, 
and cauliflower. This little plant looks very different than those domesticated crops. This is another herbaceous spring ephemeral. It grows eight to 15 inches tall. It likes rich woodland soils that are well drained. And right here we are on this little creek that is fed from a spring that comes out of the hillside just a little ways up from here. I have a pollinator flying around my phone. I'm not sure if you can catch him or not, uh, but he's been working on, or she has been working on this plant. Honeybees, minor bees, and mason bees all use these flowers, and they're very accessible to pollinators that um, have both long and short tongues or proboscis. So the flowers on this plant have four petals, and when they are fully open, which I don't think this one is yet, but when they're fully open, the petals resemble the shape of a cross. The leaves are whirled in threes, about midway up the height of the stem. This particular plant, it looks like its third leaf either got torn off or it's just emerging now. And then each individual leaf is dissected into three deeply toothed lance-shaped parts. Now you may think that the name of the plant comes from these toothy leaves, but actually it comes from deep teeth or sharp teeth that are on the rhizome. So like so many spring ephemerals, this particular plant spreads by rhizomes and is a perennial. One of the common names of this plant is pepper root, and that probably does come from the rhizomes as well. They can be chopped up and used in salads. Um, they can also be put into vinegar and ground and used as a horseradish substitute. In the center of the frame, you can see a blood root that's blooming, and right behind it is a Mary Bell that has not yet opened. And that will have bright yellow bell-shaped flowers. This little beauty here is round-lobed hepatica, hepatica americana. And it's also known as liver leaf and liver moss. And the reason for that is that the leaves are evergreen and as they overwinter, they develop this splotchiness to them, which apparently looks like liver to some people. They're in the family Ranunculaceae, which is the buttercup family that has over 2,000 species in it. And Ranunculus is Latin for little frog. This is another spring ephemeral. These are found in rich woodland soils and they are quite low growing. So these flowers can be blue, pink, white, and they have five to 12 sepals. Now, when I say sepals, I'm referring to these petal-like structures. These are actually not petals, these are sepals. And what looks like sepals on the back here, there's three, these are actually called bracts and they grow on these very hairy stalks. They bloom mid-March to mid-May, and their fruit is an akeen, and the akeen is mature in June. The fruits are actually favored by chipmunks, and the fruits also have eliasomes on them. So eliasomes are a structure on the seed that is high in proteins and lipids and is very attractive to ants. And so this is a dispersal strategy from this plant. The ants come, they pick up the seeds with the eliasomes that they're attracted to, they bring them back to their nests, and they eat the eliasomes, but they leave the actual seed intact. And the seed is brought to their waste pile, which is usually rich in nutrients, and the seed can germinate there. So that is a dispersal strategy that is 
it's actually taken advantage of by many spring ephemerals. So early North American settlers started using round leaf hepatica to treat hepatitis. And they found out that the Native Americans have been using the sharp-lobed hepatica to do the same thing. It was also a practice early on for people to eat the newly emerging flowers in the spring. It was thought that they would help protect against viper bites and also against any diseases that might emerge that year. Well, thank you for spending 15 minutes in the forest with me. I had a great time coming out and scouting for wildflowers. Uh, the difficult part of all of this is identifying the different species. I mean, there's probably 50 others out here that I don't know and I had a hard time figuring out. So next year when I do this walk, I may um, have a botanist come out with me to help identify some of the more obscure species. Uh, but it's been a really fun project coming out here and filming these little beauties. So I hope you join us next week for another edition of 15 Minutes in the Forest, Friday at 12.15. Have a great weekend.